So, my paper is entitled Artists from Middle Earth, a 21st century dive into Tolkien's secondary world. It was partly inspired by an interview of Thomas Ijo by the Tol Tolkien Collector's Guide. In this interview, Ijo explained, I quote, I looked for a technique for portraying Middle Earth from inside. I didn't want to photograph Middle Earth, I wanted to recreate it like a hobbit from the Shire or a dwarf from Erebor would do. I wanted to do art from Middle Earth, not art about Middle Earth." Unquote. Iho's approach is inspired by Tolkien himself. It creates bridges between the primary world, our own, and the secondary world, Middle Earth. This paper explores what it means for an artist working in traditional, in traditional mediums like paints, pencils, or a printing press to present their art as coming from Middle Earth, offering the viewers a dive in the secondary world, unlike what an illustration usually sets out to do. Four artists are my focus here, Alan Lee, John Howe, Thomas Hijo, and Jay Johnstone. They all embody in their own way this approach that, as far as I know, was mostly explored since the beginning of the 21st century. Alan Lee and John Howe present themselves as travelers. Thomas Hijo recreates artworks that could have been produced in Middle Earth. And last but not least, Jay Johnstone draws analogies between art history from our world and representations of characters created by Tolkien. When John Howe published his Middle Earth Traveller in 2018, he subtitled it Sketches from Bag End to Mordor. He put emphasis on the idea of a journey made by the author and artist, pencil in hand, across Middle Earth and beyond. His book is a visual guide. It presents drawings and paintings alongside short explanatory paragraphs about the history of such or such location. His book is in the direct line of Alan Lee's Lord of the Rings sketchbook, published in 2005, but with a slightly different take on the theme of the sketchbook. Alan Lee, in his Lord of the Rings sketchbook and his Hobbit sketchbook from 2019, presents his creative process in the making of the illustrations and the movie trilogies whereas John Howe lets his pictures hint at his thoughts and processes. Howe's writing in the book is mainly informational notices as you would find in a touristic guide. Despite these two different approaches in the texts, the books clearly work together. They offer similar layouts and an abundance of drawings on each spread. The choice of pencil drawings uh, over color illustrations isn't innocent. Howe's and Lee's books are sketchbooks rather than art books presenting their finished, their finished color work. It means that to them, sketches and drawings are just as important as paintings. Pencils are the handiest tools to take with you on a trip and sketch along the way. You don't need water or thick paper. You can work from anywhere on any paper surface. There's an immediacy with drawings that you don't really get with paint because you have to wait for it to dry. Even though there are some color illustrations in each of the three books, the mere number of pencil studies crystallizes the feeling that the two artists have traveled across Middle Earth and sketched as much as they could to show the marvels they've encountered on their way. These sketchbooks are the visual testimony the artists brought back from their own foray into the secondary world. In Alan Lee's sketchbooks, there's a conflation of Middle Earth and New Zealand, as he presents sketches created both for the illustrated editions of The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit, and for the movie adaptations. When the artist presents the reader with variations on the theme of the Hobbit dwelling, for instance, you can interpret it as his trial and error process while looking for the perfect entrance to Bag End. But you can also easily imagine Anan Lee walking around Hobbiton and taking notes in sketches 
of all the different dwellings he walked by. With John Howe, there's a similar blend between New Zealand and Middle Earth, but it's not an aspect he dwells, he dwells on in his writing, since his sketchbook works as a travel guide to the secondary world. Alan Lee and John Howe present themselves in their books as travelers, bringing back sketches from a place that only they can access bodily. Their journey is shrouded in mystery, but thanks to the wealth of sketches they share with us readers, we have a proper feeling of immersion, as if we stood behind them while they worked and peeked at their drawings in the making. This feeling relies heavily on the realism of their drawings and the way they blend together different inspirations taken from the primary world to offer us vistas that feel both familiar and foreign. In their cases, sketches seem less like pencil explorations to find the one good way to depict their subject than notes on the variations they observe of a specific theme. In this respect, their sketches are quite different from Tolkien's. Tolkien often wanted to draw a specific landscape or building or city and devoted several sketches to finding the correct depiction. For instance, he looked for the perfect angle and the right placement of elements in his sketches of Bag End. He didn't draw a variety of hobbit dwellings, but rather explored different ways to represent a specific one. Contrary to the artists as travelers coming back from the secondary world, other artists imagine, imagine themselves as inhabitants of Middle Earth, practicing their art with the techniques available to them in this imagined location and time. This is the case of Thomas Hijo. He is a Spanish artist whose piece entitled The Prince in Pony has received the 2016 Tolkien Society Award for Best Artwork. His Tolkien-related work is mainly composed of linocut prints. Iho works first in pencil, and then he transfers his sketch onto a linoleum block to carve it before printing the design onto paper. The materials he uses are modern, but the technique of printing is centuries old. It could very, very well have been used in Middle Earth, either in the Victorian-esque Shire or in medieval inspired cities like Minas Tirith. His technical process is a long one, but it enables him to print several identical copies of the same image in black and white. There's, there's also a raised effect on the paper because of the huge pressure applied to the piece. The paper has a slight relief where the lines of the blocks are printed, which isn't something you can achieve digitally. Though his technique is very different from both Alan Lee and John Howe, Thomas Hijo also achieves a high degree of immersion because of the level of details in his images. The pictures teem with dozens of small details that you can only see by getting close to the paper so that the print fills your whole vision and you're transported into the secondary world. There are many scenes taking place at the same time, for instance, in the Battle of the Pelena Fields, so that you can read in the book the different chapters depicting the battle illustrated here and find elements of narration scattered across the surface of the print. From the Siege of Gondor, we can spot Denethor leading Faramir's bearers down the silent street. From the ride of the Rohirrim, the actual charge is represented in the top of the composition. One can even spot Eowyn and Mary. Further in the background, the ships of Umbar from the chapter The Battle of the Pelena Fields are approaching. In order to depict as many details as possible in one scene, Thomas Hijo opts for a bird's eye view. The viewer is standing above the scene and looking down on it. The impression that one is diving into the picture is reinforced by the many vertical and diagonal lines in the composition, 
for instance, you have the walls of Minas Tirith and the edge of the pier of rock dividing the city in half. The higher level of Minas Tirith is the one closest to the viewer and the ground level is the furthest away. But the diagonal movement invites the, invites the eye to go down and discover all the vignettes of action. Last but not least, the eye is also guided by the color palette. The elements closest to the viewer, or the ones the artist wants to draw attention to, are painted in contrasted tones. For instance, the opaque light gray of the stone and the olifant contrasts with the deep red of the tiled roofs and the black lines. In comparison, the upper left-hand corner where the colors are muted attracts the eye less so that the viewer's gaze travels to this area of the image in a second time after considering the rest. With Thomas Hijo, immersion is twofold. It comes both from the technique used and from the way the artist composes his images. The overhead view he favors makes the viewer want to lean forward, not unlike a certain hobbit gazing into the mirror of Galadriel and seeing a quick succession of events out of chronological order. Frodo's vision blends together big and small events, just as the artist does in his depiction, in which a Nazgul is juxtaposed with a stray cat. Before Thomas Hijo, Tolkien also created examples of art from Middle-earth, for instance, his Numenorean carpet. There would be much to say about Tolkien's designs for, uh, from the secondary world and the importance of craftsman craftsmanship. It has been the subject of research papers in the past. Let us simply note here the common thread weaving through Iho's prints and some of Tolkien's drawings, which give us an idea of art from Middle-earth. Iho's prints achieve a very different type of immersion than Alan Lee and John Howe's sketches, but they all invite the viewers in. Iho employs a technique that could have been used used in the secondary world, whereas Lee and Howe take their contemporary tools to the fictional world. Jay Johnstone, the fourth artist we are focusing on here, embodies a third way. He uses historical techniques and iconography to create art inspired by Middle Earth through a primary world's lens. Thomas Honegger, in his essay on J. Johnstone's Isildur's Bane, shows through the analysis of this painting how the artist imagined, I quote, the work of a Middle Earth painter of the third or fourth ages. Johnstone uses a visual language that is familiar to us in order to translate modes of representation from the secondary world into the primary world. His pictures work as comments. They are not supposed to come exactly from Middle Earth. Johnstone is aware that artists from the secondary world would have different pictorial traditions steeped into their own culture. What he offers with his artworks are equivalents in a pictorial language more familiar to viewers from our world. Isildur's Bane and other pictures from this artist function as analogies through transposition and translation. Johnstone creates art that blends together various artistic traditions to evoke the sense of a painting from Middle Earth. Johnstone's portrait of the High King Elessar evokes official representations of rulers or nobility from the 14th to, to the 16th centuries. The inscription on the background wasn't a common feature at the time, but it appears, for instance, in the portrait of Jean de Le Bon, King of France, or in a portrait of King Richard III. In these historical portraits, the inscription is reduced to the minimum, the king's name and his function, 
which is even shortened in King Richard's portrait as Ang Rex for the Latin Rex Angliae or King of England. In Johnstone's portrait of King Elessar, the inscription details the subject's titles, his names and ancestry. It forms an impressive list that becomes almost decorative as it forms a lace-like pattern around the king's head. This mirrors the way Aragorn is referred to in the text, whether by himself or by heralds. On his coronation day, for instance, Faramir presents him as such. Quote, Here is Aragorn, son of Arathorn, chieftain of the Dunedain of Arnor, captain of the host of the west, bearer of the star of the north, wielder of the sword reforged, victorious in battle, whose hands bring healing, the elf stone, Elessar of the line of Velandil, Isildur's son, Elendil's son of Numenor, unquote. It's a similar description that we find in calligraphy form in this painted portrait. In J. Johnstone's artworks, it looks as if characters from Middle-earth had escaped the pages and invaded our world at various periods of time. King Elessar here is depicted as a medieval king in an official portrait. Johnstone also studied illuminated manuscripts. To create his manuscripts page, The King of the Golden Hall, he studied carefully the layout, iconography, and techniques of manuscript artists from the Middle Ages. He then steeped Middle Earth iconography into these characteristics. Hence, we can recognize here characters from The Lord of the Rings. We have Gandalf, the Three Hunters, Theoden, Eowyn, and Grima as well as cultural symbols that pervade the text, such as the white tree and the crown, the white horse on a green background, etc. The decorative frieze, shaped like a tree in full bloom, appears on both the historical page and Johnstone's recreation. Anna Lee also took inspiration from medieval manuscripts as shows his illustration of Bilbo in Rivendell, which borrows its window frame from the Limbourg brothers' very rich hours of the Duke of Berry. What I find particularly interesting in Alan Lee's picture is that it's hard to define whether the top part of the image um, is decorative or architectural. It borrows motifs and colors from the manuscript to inject a sense of history into the illustration. Medieval manuscripts find their way in different forms in pictures created by some of the artists we're considering here. This blend of the fictional with real world inspirations adds another layer of history to an already historically rich world. It creates an interdependence between the two that was already suggested by the text, but is now reinforced in a visual way. Tolkien himself took inspiration from existing historical periods and iconography in his sketches. For instance, the crown he, imag he imagines for Gondor is inspired by Egyp Egyptian crowns. The author himself drew a parallel in his letter number 211. I quote, I think the crown of Gondor, the south, the south Kingdom, was very tall, like that of Egypt, but with wings attached, not set straight back, but at an angle. The North Kingdom had only a diadem. See of the difference between the North and South Kingdoms of Egypt, unquote. This is also a reminder that even though the Middle Ages are the most common source of inspiration for visual artists illustrating Tolkien's Middle Earth, there are many other areas of influence to consider. All these artists echo Tolkien's often quoted letter 131 to Milton Waldman, in which the author wished for 
I quote, of the minds and hands wielding paint and music and drama, unquote, to prolong this creation. Some of them have set out to offer us art from Middle Earth rather than art about Middle Earth, as Thomas Hijo explained in his interview. The four artists presented here was of the 21st century, an unprecedented visual tour of an invented world and the artworks that may have been created there. I'm well aware of the lack of diversity in this corpus, so if you know of any other artists, women or people of color, who've created art from Middle Earth, I'd be grateful if you could put their names in the chat. Thank you for your attention. Amazing. Thank you very much, Mary. Um, a fantastic opening to our seminar. Just a, a, a very interesting um, look into four very different artists as well. That kind of consideration around um, whether the artwork is intended to come from uh, Tolkien's Middle Earth or not, it kind of reminded me a little bit of um, the forged manuscripts that Thomas Chatterton did in the 18th century when he was um, creating uh, creating his own um, illustrations, illuminated uh, manuscripts as well. So really, really reminded me of um, some further research. Thank you very much. Now, as I've been posting in the chat, um, if you have questions, please do use the Q&A function as well. And they have been lighting up. So Mary, I'm going to pose you a few <laughs> questions uh, that have been uh, posted. So first, uh, this is a bit of a long one, but it, it looks quite juicy. So, thanks Mary. Um, if I have understood correctly, you mentioned how Tolkien's drawings view landscapes as if from outside, whereas uh, Howe and Lee tend to detail figures from within the world. When comparing this to Tolkien's short story, Leaf by Niggle, would it be sensible to say that Tolkien's art views his created world like how Niggle views his painting, whereas Howe and Lee uh, embed themselves within the world just as Niggle enters it um, in the story's conclusion? Well, I think it's fair to say that uh, Niggle was inspired by Tolkien himself. That's not a secret, but I think the idea of Tolkien and Tolkien sketches is that he didn't want to represent everything in his creation. He wanted to represent specific landscapes or locations, whereas Alan Lee and John Howe tries, try to give us, to give us um, an overview of everything that is available in Middle Earth. I think that's the difference here. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and our second one has requested uh, to see a picture of the Prancing Pony again and wondered if you could maybe uh, comment a little bit more about that picture as well. Sure, let me find it. Um, here we are uh, with the detail here. So yeah, uh, I love this picture. I mean, it's very lively. You can feel the atmosphere of the of the inn. You have all these details. We have Frodo who's falling from the table. We have a piper entertaining some young guests. We have cats everywhere. We have um, Aragorn in a corner. I think I can't find him again, but he's there. It's, it's really fascinating. And with this overhead view, you really have a chance to see all the details. So I think it's, it's really striking. Yeah, certainly. It's, it really gives that kind of crowded feel of uh, what the Prancing Pony uh, kind of comes across like as well. Thank you. Um, okay, and another one. We've got quite a few, You've been very popular. Uh, Mary, do you think an artist wanting to manifest art from Middle Earth should study in depth the cultural art of the societies that inspired Tolkien, such as a Norse slash Viking influence in portraying Rohan, for example? Well, that would be helpful, but I'm really eager to see art um, from Middle Earth that's, mm, let's say, different 
simply simply put i'm really looking forward to artists uh, taking inspiration from Middle Earth and from what we can find in the text, but then making art that we haven't seen before. Brilliant. Yeah, and I think you said as well at the end uh, that kind of shout out that if anyone knew of any um, other illustrators and artists as well, please to get in touch uh, with you. So yeah, anyone in the chat, anyone watching on YouTube, um, please get in contact with Mary um, or share a link if you know. Um, any further artists. Okay, next question. What does the use of halos in the, qu uh, in the pictures say about the artist and how they view the figures and ourselves? Are we to view the Middle Earth figures as saints for our age? Hmm, that's a question that is answered in Jay Johnstone's book that you can see <laughs> behind me. So I highly suggest you go and read Thomas Honegger's article because it's, it's online, it's free, and it's, it's an in-depth study of what it means for Jay Johnstone to create pictures like the ones he creates, taking inspiration from religious art. And I won't try to paraphrase what he very well said. Okay, super, thank you much. And you said um, that Thomas's article is free as well for people to access. Yes, Amazing. absolutely. Yeah, brilliant. Free academia, that's what we love. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Thank you for your very interesting uh, paper, Marie. Do you have an illustration of a black rider by uh, Tolkien himself? So are we aware of oh. a black rider illustration by the professor? That's a very interesting question. I can't find one on the top of my head, but that's something we can work on and search in the books. So I'll keep that in mind. And, um, but I, I can't remember seeing a picture like that from what I've read. Um, he didn't draw many characters. We have a couple of Gandalfs, a few hobbits here and there, but um, I really can't remember seeing any Black Rider by Tolkien. Mm -hmm. I think he wanted to keep them uh, away from, from the picture. Yeah, almost kind of like the obscurity itself, if you give that image, it kind of loses some of the impact, maybe. Absolutely. That's why we don't see Sauron in the books. It's only a presence, uh, an ominous presence in the background, but we mm. never see him. Yeah. Well, well uh, one of the speakers later on, Nick Groom, is going to, uh, going to be talking to us about the Nazgul. So uh, maybe Nick will be able to expand a little bit um, on this, possibly. Thank you, Mary. Um, okay, how are we doing for time? Right, I think we could fit another question in. Um, okay, do you have a favorite Tolkien artist or illustrator? Oh, that's the worst question. <laughs> <laughs> it would be unfair to pick a favorite from even the four I've presented here. But I just, I see in the chat that um, someone comments that we see Sauron on the top of the Return of the King cover. And that's true. It's not a black rider, but at, at least we see a bit of Sauron. We see his upper body with his arms uh, extended. So that's something something to, to look at. But no, I'm sorry. I can't pick a favorite. It's, it's too hard. I love them all. <laughs> It's like your favourite character sometimes, it's just, you, you can't answer those questions. It changes all the time. Yeah, I, I know exactly that feeling. Okay, <laughs> Mary, I would like to thank you so much for opening our seminar with a fantastic uh, paper. So thank you thank very you. much. Thank it's you. It's been a pleasure.